Hello everyone and welcome to the episode 41 of the IWFM Navigating Turbulent Times series. As you can see on your screens there, um, today's webinar is entitled Harnessing the Power of Real Estate and Facilities Data and this is in partnership with our partners PlanOn. So if we move on to the next slide, um, for many of you, you would have seen me on our episodes and yes, they still invite me back. So I might be doing something right or wrong, but you might tell me that later. I'm Peter Brogan, Head of Research and Insight at the Institute. And you can see a stellar lineup of our uh, panelists today and, and speakers. So we've got some formal presentations today, tying in with our guidance note that was launched a couple of weeks ago with Plan, Plan On about harnessing the power of data. So that's going to be referenced quite a lot in today's episode and is available on our website currently. Just to remind viewers, listeners, today's episode is going to be recorded. Yes, this is live, so we'll be cascaded out afterwards. And we do have a Q, dedicated Q&A section uh, towards the end of the presentation, but we would invite questions as, as the webinar goes ahead and we try and get as many of your questions and more importantly answers to those questions in this webinar. So as you can see on your screens there, we have Gert Yamplum, um, Solution and Product Marketeer at PlanOn, James Pinder, Workplace Change Agent, Free Edges, and Ian Ellison, Workplace Change Agent at Free Edges also. So like many hosts, I've said this before in my episodes, I don't read off the bios. I'm going to uh, pass over to Gert Jan now, just to give a little bit of introduction to yourself, Gert, to get to know, let the audience know who you are and also what's in store for today's episode. So, uh, hello, Gert Jan. Good day. Hello, Peter. Good day to all the others. Good day to James and I. And uh, my name is uh, Geert Jan Blom. Sorry for that. It's a Dutch name and I know it's hard to pronounce if you're not from, uh, if you're not a Dutch one. So, uh, I don't As blame. I've proven or hasten to add. I know, and uh, it's good. Just call me Geert. I will listen to that as well. Uh, yeah, I work, in, uh, I work for Plano quite a while now, uh, 14 years uh, to be precise, uh, of which the last three years in, uh, in the field of product marketing. Um, and together with, uh, with IWFM and with three, three edges, we conducted the research. Uh, and uh, of course, James and Ian will discuss um, the research in more detail. But uh, I would like to, uh, to highlight a bit how business automation can uh, help you to being a practical uh, yeah, guidance or a practical uh, example of how to, to achieve um, data and uh, data management and, and, and in the end how to harness, what is the title of this webinar as well, harness the power of that data. And uh, that's a bit what I would like to add in this, uh, in this webinar. And um, thank you for that. And we've got lots to go through as well. So uh, just moving, as you see on our screens there, to James. Hello, James. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, my name's James Pinder. I'm a co-founder and director at Three Edges. Um, and we we do a mix of workplace consultancy, uh, research and thought leadership. And we've been doing quite a lot of that with uh, with IWFM. And we also, we also do education as well. And, and those three things uh, interlink with each other. Um, and today we'll be talking about some of the, the research that we've been doing with PlanOn and IWFM um, around, around data and, and the use of data in, in FM and workplace. No, thank you for that, James. And last but not least, Ian, hello. Hi there, Peter. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, well, actually, it definitely will be least this time because James has pretty much said everything that we needed to say. So Ian Ellison, the uh, other co-founder and director at Three Edges. And yeah, really looking forward today to sharing some of our sort of headline findings from the piece of work that we did with IWFM and with PlanOn. Um, and just, yeah, I guess, trying to, you know, really nudge at some of the more thought provoking sides of, of, of this topic and get you thinking and let's get a really nice Q&A going towards the end of the session. That's great and thank you. So now folks you've uh, got an introduction to who's be speaking today, a bit of flavour of what we're going to be uh, speaking about. As you can imagine there's lots to go through so you don't want to be listening to me for much longer so you'll be pleased to know you won't be. We'll encourage you for the Q&A. Uh, spoiler alert, there is some polls and some interactivity we'd like you to get involved so um, please get involved as much as you can. So you're going to see me later at the Q&A so I will leave you now and I will pass over to Gert Jan. So uh, enjoy the webinar folks. Great, thank you, Peter. Let's see if I have control. Yeah, I have. That's working fine. Uh, well, before I will hand over to uh, to James and Ian again, who will talk you through the research. I think it could be wise to introduce Plan on a bit and explain why we have partnered with IWFM and Three Edges to conduct uh, to conduct this research. And um, 
I think uh, most of the uh, attendees are already familiar with IWFM and Three Edges, but less familiar with uh, Planon maybe. So let me quickly introduce uh, Planon for those of you who don't already know us. For more than 35 years, uh, Planon has focused on software solutions to support the built environment, and it's our mission to optimize the process within real estate and facility management to improve building operation, create a healthy and an engaging workplace for building users, and make better use of limited resources. And we're a, a global provider of integrated workplace management systems and associated consultancy services as well uh, for many years. And we are recognized by uh, by industry analysts like Fedantix um, as a market leader. And um, some um, attendees may not be familiar with, uh, with an integrated workplace management system, or as we would usually say, an IWMS, and um, how to position it in the field of business uh, and enterprise software solutions. And therefore, I will talk briefly about what an IWMS uh, is before uh, James, and I will explain, and I, I as well, how such a software solution might help you to harness the power of data. Well, as Fedantix in this case explains, an IWMS is an enterprise uh, scale software platform which helps organizations to capture and analyze information, manage their operations, and optimize and report on the management of real estate portfolios. And most of the time, this includes the areas of leases, capital projects, facility and space utilization, services of workplace services, uh, also maintenance, energy and sustainability management. And sometimes you hear other acronyms in the market like CAFM or CMMS. And although they, they differ uh, slightly in functionality, most of the time people mean the same type of enterprise software. But today we will keep our focus on the acronym IWMS. And an IWS can be used by real estate, facilities, management and IT professionals to manage the entry and life cycle of corporate facilities. And it helps to optimize the use of workplace resources to provide an improved employee experience. And it also assists in cost containment by monitoring the real estate portfolio. So in other words, uh, it supports all these stakeholders in achieving their strategic objectives. And many real estate and facility management organizations struggle to meet their strategic objectives because they are not able to make the right decisions based on accurate information or lack of control and cannot align their strategy at the corporate level. And an underlying reason for these struggles is most of the time the inability to harness the power of the data due to the data being fragmented or data being out of date or incomplete or not being able to easily access the data. And as shown in a market research by Vedantix, one of the main reasons for organizations to choose uh, to invest in an IWMS is to resolve this inability because it brings all data together in one single source of truth that supports organizations to improve not only operations but also strategic decision making. And although it can resolve some technical barriers, implementing an IWMS is not the holy grail or the silver bullet. And as a company, we plan on, in this case, have been active in the field of business automation, automation and digitalization for more than 35 years. And when we are onboarding new types of customers, very often they struggle with more organizational oriented barriers. And to help organizations deal with this, we wanted to give the market some research-based guidance because in the current era of digital transformation, organizations will be confronted with automation and data projects more and more. And we are very pleased to have partnered with IWFM and Three Edges to conduct such research and come up with a practical guidance note. And I'm very proud that uh, today we can show you the results of the research that not only shows what your peers say about the value of data and how to use it in the right way, but also contains the lessons they learned and prov provides the practical guidance for the use and application of data in, in an increasingly digital world. And now I will hand over to you, James, eh? um, so that you can share the details of the research. And after this, I will come back to you again and tell you a bit more how an IWMS can help you to uh, leverage the hidden data treasures in your real estate and facility management organizations. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Kurt uh, Jan. Um, if I move on to the next slide. So, yeah, what I'd like to do is just explain a little bit of background and context of the research we did. Uh, uh, with Planon and IWFM, and and I guess part of it is looking at the the broader picture of data having become an increasingly important topic in in boardrooms and at at senior level within organisations, not 
not just within FM and real estate, but in, in the wider world of work. And, you know, we know that when we're working with organisations, data has become a, an important topic. And, and yeah, increasingly leadership teams are looking to work out how they can harness data to, to give themselves a competitive advantage in the marketplace. So, so I guess that's that broader context. And, you know, you'll hear terms like data being the new oil and, 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 and I guess slightly cliched terms like that. But I guess underlying that is, is, a, is an element of truth that data is important. We all use data in a day-to-day -day lives often often without thinking about it. And um, it, it, it does play a, a critical role in, in, I guess, the modern global economy. Now, what's interesting, and you know, this has already been alluded to, is that I guess FM is still compar comparatively immature when it comes to understanding the value of data and 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 I guess how to to uh, harness that data. And Ian and I know that from years of working with FMs, um, both from an educational point of view, but also through through our consultancy as well. So you know, we know that you know some FMs are, are further ahead in this area than others, but generally, as a, as a as, as I guess a uh, profession and an industry, um, you know, there is still work to do there. And you know, we ne we also know that sometimes this can lead to you know frustration, conflict, and and a negative image for the industry. If the data is not there to help them make decisions, then this this can be frustrating. So what we wanted to do in this research was to look outside of the industry and look at um, lessons and and good practice uh, in other sectors and try and contextualize that, bring that back into the the workplace and FM industry, and look at how how um, FM professionals and workplace professionals can, can take those lessons and, and use them to improve what they do. So Nicole, could you run the poll please? What we'd like to do now is just to get you thinking about your own experiences and what we've listed on, on this um, on, on this poll is some of the things that Ian and I see when we're working with, with clients and, and when we're doing uh, educational work with facilities managers. These are some of the things that we know are, are problems in the industry. Um, and what we'd like you to do is just have a think about your own experience. And when, when we set the poll running is select the select the problems that you've encountered, that you encounter in your day-to-day -day work. And you can select as many or as, as few as you want, um, but just have a think and yeah, so have a read through them. I'll, I'll talk through them as well as, you, as you're responding and um, let's see, see what sort of issues you're experiencing in the work that you're doing. So if you could run the poll, please, Nicole. Okay, so perfect, so I can see. Those coming in, just to let you know, about fifty percent of the audience have answered so far. Uh, so, okay, brilliant, Nicole. Thank you. So, yeah, so the 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 five things we've listed on here: not having the right data when you need it, um, data being out of date or incomplete, and that's something that we we often see in in organisations. Uh, not being able to easily access data held by other parties in the organisation. So the data may be there, it may be complete, but for whatever reason, you can't get hold of that data. Um, or maybe the data is in the wrong format or the different format, so that or a different format, and maybe that that creates a, a barrier to being able to do something with that data. Or maybe you've got the data and you've got the data in the right form, but maybe you don't know what to do with that data. Maybe you don't know how to analyse that data or make sense of it. So Nicole, how we, how are we doing with the poll, please? Perfect. So I think the majority of the audience have answered that now. So I'm just going to close it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Are you able to bring up the results now as well, please, Nicole? Yes, of course. There we go. Right. So you should see those okay. on screen now. All right. So really, uh, th well, first of all, thanks for engaging with that and taking part in that poll. So really interesting, interesting sort of spread of results that obviously uh, a lot of issues that people are encountering, which again, doesn't necessarily surprise us, but it's interesting to see that uh, that spread and, and yeah, the sort of issues that we see when, when we're engaging with organisations are coming through there. Interestingly, the one that, that is, I guess, least problematic on that list is knowing what to do with the data. The, 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 the bigger issue is um, getting the right data or getting hold of that data that, that you actually need to be able to, to do that analysis. So interesting. I think what we'll do is we'll 
come back to that later in the session uh, during the Q and A because I've, I've I've got a feeling that Ian and Gert Jan will will also have some, something to say about those results. Okay, so I'll just explain a little bit about the research that we under, undertook uh, for for Planon and IWFM, and then Ian's going to explore the. Uh, or talk around the findings in a little bit more detail. So what we decided to do with this research was something a little bit different than is sometimes uh, done in these sorts of studies where they might do a, a, an online survey or a survey of, of, of practitioners. What we wanted to do in this research was do a more in-depth uh, look at uh, practice in, in this area, practice around the use and value of data. So what we did was uh, 15 in-depth interviews with senior leaders from, from different sectors. So from, from telecoms, oil and gas, technology and, and software. And, and some of the software uh, uh, companies that we we sort of engage with are doing work in and around real estate and FM, but that's not necessarily their core business. They they are sort of familiar with FM and real estate, but they are that's one area that they're working in. So we were interested in finding out what what was happening in these other areas, and some of these are, I guess, at the forefront of of, of using data. Others are, uh, you know, I guess on on a on uh, you know learning themselves about. How, how to get more out of data. Uh, so interviews, interviewees were senior people in organisations. They would either had first-hand experience of leading or implementing major data initiatives in, in organisations or in client organisations. And what we did through the interviews, we explored four things. So the first one was around the role and value of data in, in their organisations or their client organisations. We then explored the benefits and opportunities that come from making better use of data. So why 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 even take this issue seriously? I guess and how um, and you know what are the organisational benefits. And we also explored the barriers and challenges to creating value from data. So what are the things that are stopping us getting more more from data? And and then again going back to that sort of practical focus, which is what we wanted to do in this research was well, what are the tactics and strategies that that organizations can can use to to make better use of the data that they've got or that they're collecting so we did these interviews last year back in back in the autumn in september uh, september october, uh, october uh, last year uh, and um the the interviews generated some really interesting insights so ian can i hand over to you now and you can have a chat through the findings please you can indeed james if you just move on to the next slide for me Okay, so what we're really encouraging you to do here, folks, is you know go and get hold of that report and have a good read of it because you know these findings come to life in the report and the sort of the examples and the stories that we tell from our uh, fifteen interviewees. But um, yeah, I'd encourage you to think about this. We, we we try to do this in a really inductive way. So we had those areas that we were interested in, and we wanted people to just you know, essentially talk around the topics, and then we were able to kind of look for the dominant themes and the sub themes that were linked to what the interviewees were talking about. So uh, I kind of got two, two images to talk to you. One is about the value of data, this one, and you can kind of think about this as, as, as the product, if you like. If we get this right, what do we get from using data effectively? And then um, in a couple of slides time, we're going to explore the themes that came out around creating value. So that's almost like the process towards getting this right. So product first and then process afterwards. And there's this an interesting little kind of thinking tool which we used in the middle, which will encourage you to use as well. So in terms of the, the value of the data, the benefits and the opportunities, if you like, the three key themes were improved decision making, increase, in, increasing efficiency organizationally and creating better customer experiences. And, you know, to really focus on the outputs here, you might need data to do this, but these are tangible business benefits which is what this is really about, data driving these sorts of things. And then what you'll see around the edge of these, these three key themes are essentially the sub themes. So around improved decision making, we get the ability to make smarter decisions, quicker decisions. We get the ability for increased transparency and we get to, um, you know, via, via a range of techniques, start thinking about complexity and making sense of that. And in some ways, simulating 
um, simulating different situations so that we can make the right um, the right decisions um, and kind of linked to that but we've put it in a slightly different position as this diagram is the notion of automation being able to create decision engines to actually save some of the heavy lifting um, and, and and where we know that machines and AI for example can do things like that on our behalf better around increased efficiency we've got the quicker decisions and we've got the ability to deal with complexity and automation but we've also got this this way of being able to optimize for different things and what we mean by that is you know thinking about different customer segments for example or thinking about different things that the business needs to do being able to move quicker with the right data to be able to do that on adding to that for better customer experiences we've got better customer insights we've got the ability to segment custom markets so that we can make better insights there so irrespective of whether this was oil or telecoms or whether this was the software industry whoever we were speaking to we were hearing these repeating themes at a senior level and it's worth bearing that in mind if you think about the need for FM to be able to engage more directly in business language terms with senior leadership and that's one of the challenges we always face as an industry as a professional and that's one of the things that we always talk about needing to do better this gives us a way to be able to do that because these are all about genuine business needs so James if you just move to the next slide please so I talked about this kind of slightly creative thinking tool which we also used in the interviews and I'd encourage you folks to, to do this now and to kind of ponder this one or maybe think about it more extensively when you read the report or maybe use it as a conversation starter in your own organizations when you start talking about this so the question we posed was you know if if your organization metaphorically speaking was a car then where in the car or what part of the car do you think data is and at first you might kind of go well, what, what sort of question is that but quite often and this is the case when you use metaphors and you kind of do a little bit of storytelling to try and get under a topic you can learn far more about what's really going on and then after we kind of asked that question we start we, we asked well you know is that the right place for data you know thinking play with this idea where should it be in the car or what part of the car should it be so what we've got on the right hand side of this slide is we've got these kind of four really nice examples of the way that different respondents kind of used this idea to talk about not just what was going on but what they wanted to be going on in future or what data needed to be or the way that they've got things so you know you can see you can see a journey of change in the first statement in the past it was visible on the back seat just out of reach data is now in the passenger seat where we can touch it but it's, it's not really there yet it's not on the heads up display maybe in 18 months it might be in the driver's seat that's the aim so you can see this kind of aspirational transition from how data was in the past to how it's being used now to where it needs to be whereas the second from the bottom data is the engine the base layer it powers everything data drives the company we're a Tesla we're sleek we're efficient you can see a very dominant strong comfortable position from from that participant around how they're feeling about data so as I say you know it's nice little thinking tool it's also a conversation starter so I'd encourage yourselves to think about that and to get talking about data in these terms because you might be surprised what sort of conversations and opportunities it unlocks Okay, James, so we just move on, please. So I said that the previous diagram was about the actual product, if you like, the value that we get from using data effectively. So this is more about the, if you like, the, the, um, the challenges and the, the things that we need to think about to be able to get value to create value so this is the as I said this is like the process if you like so the themes the key themes data integration data governance and data literacy so these are much more about the thing they're not necessarily about what you get from the thing that would make sense right because this is how you get there but then the sub themes these are really quite interesting so around data integration needing to create future proof data it needing to be clean and accurate it needing to be secure and in the right place, which starts to link into the data government's perspective. But this one really stood out to James and I, and, and it's worth sort of thinking this through. You know, a single source of truth, 
interviewees talked about this in different ways and what they were meaning was you know we can't have this siloed fragmented data we're all trying to say the same thing but we don't know which one's right or wrong it's not a problem for people in different parts of the business to use the data differently but it has to be aligned to a single source of truth and some people called it almost like a mastered version it's like the it's the golden source so so that's a really interesting thing to bear in mind because how do you do that as an organization in a way which is inclusive and which allows people to use the data to their needs but without um, with that, so, so it's open if you like, but, but how does you prevent that from then becoming sort of dispersed around the business and then things getting fragmented? So moving into data governance, we've already talked about, oh, sorry, Jane, can you go back again, please? We've already talked about single source of truth and, and, and data being secure in the right place, but let's think about accountable owners and let's think about data culture as well. And what you start to see in this slide then is we're sort of moving from the technical aspects of data on the left towards the more cultural, the people aspects of data on the right. So around data literacy, the right people, People, um, approaching data with the right attitude, the data culture, bringing people up to speed through education programs. And that doesn't just mean the people directly accountable, that means the business more broadly in terms of the value of data, and that can link to communication campaigns. So as I said, in the report itself, lots of content, lots of good stuff to sort of trigger your thinking in those areas, but here's the headlines. So moving on, please. So just kind of elaborating a little bit around these barriers, and I started to talk about it on the previous slide around the sort of the technical, the data stuff on the left-hand side and the culture on the right-hand side. But, you know, we, we, there were key themes coming out of the information, um, coming out of the interviews, um, which we were seeing kind of repeatedly around technical aspects, things like data being stored in lots of different ways, legacy IT systems, data sets with missing or, in, or inaccurate data or unstructured data, particularly the qualitative stuff so that you can't see it, you can't get to it, you can't reuse it. Whereas over on the right hand side, cultural barriers, lack of awareness, and understanding and the potential that it can bring, tendency for departments to kind of, you know, kind of shield the data and keep it to themselves. That old adage of knowledge is power was kind of there in what we were seeing. Data being manipulated and presented to give the answers that are expected. So that classic thing of, you know, all good and well to have evidence, but if that decision-making process introduces different types of bias, political biases, political agendas, then things can change. And irrespective of the evidence, people not trusting or believing it. So lots of good stuff there. Now, the reason there's a little little chat icon there is we would love you to share with us in um, the chat channel or the questions channel, whichever one is, is available to you. Um, it would be really interesting for the Q&A whether any of these resonate with you, whether you agree or disagree with these, whether um, you think that some are more dominant than others in your own particular example, or whether you've got any questions about them. But these are really interesting topics for us to get underneath and we'd love to hear how you feel about them. So get typing away, please. Next slide, please, James. Okay, so we conclude the report um, with kind of a, a cautionary tale, if you like, five pitfalls to avoid. So um, Giat Yan mentioned this right at the beginning, you know, making sure that we don't see technology as a silver bullet, making sure that we don't become preoccupied with the latest digital fads and fashions. It's quite hard when they're, you know, that grand narrative of of you know the importance of data and digital for our futures not to get caught up in that trying to do too much trying to run before you can walk underestimating the time effort and resource required because this ultimately is cultural and organizational investment as much as it's digital investment and collecting or generating insights that aren't business relevant you know everything looks important when you're looking at a data set you still need to be able to sort the wood from the trees so um, I think we're going to pass back now what's on the next slide James yes we're going to pass back to Giat Yan to kind of bring those findings to life in a plan on and IWMS context yes thank you Ian uh, sorry uh, and great 
also James, that you shared these meaningful insights of the research. Um, I'm obviously uh, convinced that this will help uh, the organizations in the fields to, um, to utilize uh, their hidden data treasures in the end. Um, but before I hand it over to you guys, uh, I addressed what an item is, is, in, is about. And in this part of the webinar, I would like to discuss uh, the benefits of it and how it can help you to improve your data usage and also the data management. Um, and therefore, in this case, I would like to uh, link my story to some of the elements of the research and uh, starting in this case with the barriers that were revealed by the research and also I, uh, Ian just uh, just mentioned um, and I think in this case implementing uh, business automation can serve as a single that can serve as a single source of truth can really help you to tear down or break down these types of uh, barriers and there are uh, practically uh, two main types of barriers that or organizations have to contend with. And the first one uh, are those technical barriers, like uh, Ian already mentioned, data being stored in lots of different systems and spreadsheets, the lack of the IT systems and processes, also the data sets containing uh, missing or inaccurate data was an important one, what I saw in the in the results of the poll, uh, but also the unstructured, uh, unstructured or qualitative data stored in uh, documents or in other difficult to use formats. Um, and concerning breaking down these types of, uh, of kinds of barriers, the implementation of, for instance, an IWMS can directly provide a solution. Uh, and I will explain why um, and how that we will do this after I've mentioned the other type of barriers you might face. And these are, the technical ones, or sorry, the cultural ones, the cultural barriers, uh, like a lack of awareness, uh, the tendency of departments and managers to keep the data to their own. Eh? It's their data and you may not touch it. We refer to this uh, like uh, to it as siloed uh, data sets. Uh, we have that data that is being manipulated and presented to give answers that were, for instance, uh, for instance expected by the senior leaders or you have to deal with the uh, lack of accountability, the ownership, or uh, even the lack of governance of uh, corporate data. Uh, the one that also was mentioned, people not trusting or being skeptical of data, uh, or data being seen as an IT problem rather than a business asset. Um, and in this case, in the case of cultural barriers, implementing an IWMS can serve uh, as an enabler for change. And let me briefly explain how in these situations the implementations of uh, this kind of software can help you deal with this. Yes. Um, well, first of all, the, uh, a solution like we can offer, in this case, NIDL UMS, can help you to improve the data quality. Um, like uh, James and Ian, and also I, myself already mentioned, organizations that are using lots of distributed data sources or, or disparate software solutions to manage the real estate and facility management data will eventually run into uh, problems um, as it is difficult to maintain tight data quality control and data consistency with all kinds of consequences, of course. And by replacing these separate data or software solutions uh, with, for instance, an IWMS, um, you may improve the quality of data by having a single source of truth in a single system, what was already mentioned as an important element. And it can be integrated with other applications in your data landscape for, for instance, an initial upload or a periodical exchange of real-time real data connection. This is also a possibility. And with this, you can keep all data sources up to date without any uh, redundancy or differences. And in this case, such business software directly offers a solution for breaking down some of those technical barriers. But replacing um, legacy systems and standalone uh, data sources with one single source of truth not only improves data usage and data management, but by consolidating your IT landscape, you can also drive process standardization. For instance, uh, with the use of uh, best practices or pre-configured workflows and reports, you can start standardizing processes to get in, in control, not only during the implementation, but uh, also during the entire lifetime of the software to make sure that it's continuously aligned with uh, and also between the, the, the business of the different business domains that rely on, on the same kind of data sources. And in this case, it's not only uh, there to help uh, to create awareness and understanding of data and its potential, it also helps to unify uh, roles and improve cross-functional workflows, and in the end, stimulate process automation, which uh, improves, improves also productivity and uh, interdepartmental cooperation. 
And additionally, uh, it also offers the opportunity to address data ownership, the accountability, and also the data governance, which are, which are important elements you saw from the cultural um, barriers perspective. But there's still some more to, to share. Um, the consolidation of your system landscape can also break down uh, data silos, which enables better decision making. I take an IWMS again as an example, because in this type of solution, all real estate and asset services and workplace uh, information uh, is available. In one data source, you can use an integrated view to make, for instance, more informed investment decisions uh, based on a more complete understanding of your, your own real estate and workplace management portfolio. Or in another example, uh, take the coordination of maintenance. Uh, this can be a real struggle when data on asset condition and maintenance workflows is distributed across separate applications. And the use of one IWS of, of an IWS that has that one single source of truth can really prevent these types of situations. This even may serve as a proof of why it is important to break down those data silos and not keep data for yourself. And by showing the benefits of this uh, can bring um, of the benefits that this can bring to your people in the organization, um, it can help them to even um, yeah dispel data skepticism within your organization. But there's not only, um, there are not only data-related or process-related benefits. The implementation of one uh, central solution that offers a broad, broad scale of business functionality can also lower your IT support costs. And the consolidation of your system landscape will reduce the complexity in your IT infrastructure and makes application management easier and more efficient. And at large firms, this means that the subsidiaries or and also regional locations can all use the same software version that is maintained centrally. And as well as easy updates and upgrades, new functionality and capabilities can be easily added, especially uh, when choosing uh, a cloud deployment. Uh, so as you see, there are a lot of advantages of centralizing data and improving your data management by implementing business solutions that can serve as a single source of truth. And now you might think uh, this is more easily said than done, or you wonder where to start. Uh, well. There are certain steps that can give you, uh, in this case, any guidance. And of course, uh, as it is with the most things in life, um, this starts with getting the basics in place. And like James presented, the IWMS um, guidance note mentions here three important elements uh, to which you should pay attention when organizi organizing uh, the fundamental fundamentals of improving data use and data management. And these are, in this case, data integration, data governance, and data literacy. And within these three elements, um, there are key parts that play an important role. And plotted on a scale, you could say that um, the left element is a real IT matter, uh, which can be addressed with technology, and the other two are more organizational matters. And these are best addressed by using a people-centric change management approach. And based on what I sh uh, shared in the previous slides, an uh, implementation of, for instance, an IWMS can certainly help you to get the basics in place concerning the data integration, uh, but it can also set the wheels in motion for, the, for organizing data governance. And when you start working huh, on getting these basics in place, it is important to investigate if your solution is really capable of future-proofing your data management, uh, especially because of the following reason. The built environment is becoming uh, smarter and smarter day by day, driven by the developments like uh, Internet of Things and also the things that are happening around smart building, like smart building technology. And this makes all uh, kinds of new data come available. And this development is uh, fueled by the growing emergence of property technology or prop tech. And a lot of new types of solutions are becoming available in the market, all serving different purposes and offering new possibilities and opportunities you probably don't want to miss. And this development leads to uh, some new needs and also some new goals. And for instance, uh, given the increasing complexity, you still want to ensure a single pane of glass view on your portfolio level. And although each building in practice uh, will be equipped with different solutions that all deliver data and information in different formats and also in uh, isolated sources, you still want to achieve a single view on your portfolio. And it's also important to have the ability to easily connect all the different types of technology and solutions 
that are or even may come be, uh, become available so that you can keep up with the opportunities and the possibilities. And once you have connected it, it, uh, it is important that you can gain business value out of it. And therefore, you need to be able to embed it into your uh, business processes so that, for instance, data of, on, on crowding in buildings is turned into useful information for decision making concerning the adjustments uh, or improvement of certain services or facilities that you run in these buildings. And of course, you want to deal with this in a manageable and in, a, in this case, a cost efficient way. And once you start connecting and embedding all of these technologies and make and maybe also start building customizations uh, for all of these integrations you want to prevent this resulting in a gigantic unstructured mess that you will never be able to manage and in the end never will gain value from so therefore choose wisely uh, when you start future proofing your cre and fm data management and look um, for solutions that enable you to uh, to take advantage of the ongoing digitization in this in the built environment in this case but as uh, i think it was already said by james or ian maybe uh, don't try to run before you can walk uh, start with getting your basics in place and work on organizational alignment and the centralization of data in a system that serves as a single source of truth i break down those technical barriers and get rid of spreadsheets and all those legacy systems and also update and, and, uh, and complement existing data. That's really important. And as you saw in one of the video captures that I showed you, showed you earlier, um, this gives you a better foundation to report on and also respond to business events. Use, for instance, uh, self-service dashboards that put actionable insights and intelligence at people's fingertips to improve decision making. And when this is in place, you could enlarge your, your data scope by connecting, for instance, prop tech driven data sources like uh, sensor systems or building management systems. And with an IWMS uh, like, like we can offer, you can even extend it functionally uh, by um, adding bi uh, additional business logic uh, yeah, in an easy and manageable way. And when embedding the data of these connections uh, or the additional functionality of these extensions into the business processes that already run in your single source of truth, you can even automate them with elements like a decision engine. And this will save you uh, also some effort, but also time. And most of the time this leads to improved responses. Not only, uh, uh, this is not only uh, increasing the efficiency, but also enhancing the experience for your uh, internal customers. And when I'm having all these data streams connected and embedded, you have uh, the opportunity to create a single pane of glass for your real estate portfolio. And use, for instance, uh, predictive analytics and business intelligence tools to create that holistic um, view out of your data and to, you know, to, in this case, better strategize and plan uh, for the future. And in this way, you can really turn data uh, like the that familiar uh, pyramid, maybe you, you, you are familiar with it, you can turn data into wisdom and get the most out of your hidden data treasures um, to add maximum value also to your company's bottom line. And in case if you, you need to convince internally some people uh, who might be skeptical about the investments, um, also in this case, the IWFM guidance note offers great starting points for building that business case around the improvement of your, your data and your data management capabilities. As uh, I think it was James, uh, or in this case, Ian, who explained it during the part, his part of the webinar. And uh, I discussed in the last couple of slides what added value in IWMS could bring. Uh, and as you see, this can also be perfectly linked to these starting points, as mentioned in the guidance note. But there is even something more to share. Uh, in this case, Fedantix has found that besides the areas that we just mentioned, there are also a lot of, uh, to gain in areas like IT rationalization and operational savings. And this is shown by their uh, business case example, or in this case, a hypothetical uh, insurance firm uh, that is making a comprehensive rollout of a full IDMS platform, in this case, across uh, 45 uh, sites with 80,000 employees. And uh, it is important in this case to mention then to know that the ROI will be different for all companies out there as it depends on your starting points uh, and the shape of your real estate. But in this uh, example, the investment across the services and the software or the configuration and the internal IT time was already covered by the uh, IT savings and the staff time savings. 
and the rest uh, related to the more operational kinds of savings could be considered as a as a great bonus and this shows why organizations uh, of in this case why it's in, in important and beneficial to organize and improve your data management uh, and it is not only a, a beneficial from an organizational perspective, but also very interesting for, uh, for the organizational's bottom line, as you see in this graph. And I think in this case, we come to the last part of the webinar, uh, in which uh, at least I, but I think we all want to include with some uh, suggestions and even, even some practical uh, takeaways for some further guidance. So maybe you, James, want to go first in this case? Yeah, if you could move on a slide, please, Kurt Yatten. I can. Of course. Thank you. I think I can. <laughs> I don't. Th I don't have the controls at this moment. I believe. I've tried moving it on as well. Okay. Hey, there we are. Thank you, whoever did that. Okay. Um, yeah. What if 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 you're familiar with the guidance notes that we've produced for IWFM in the past. Uh, one of the things we try to do in, in our guidance notes is to get you thinking about your own situation and how you could do things differently. And, and as you work through this uh, uh, harnessing the power of data guidance note, one of the things we do is periodically as, as, as we work the way through the guidance notes to get you think about your own situation and, and maybe scribble down a few notes. And then at the end of the guidance note, we've introduced a bit of a, a self-assessment. And this is essentially a bit of a thinking tool, really, just to get you to reflect on where your organization is or where your team is. So we'd encourage you as, as one of the sort of takeaways from, from this webinar is to, is to well, first of all, download the guidance note, but then go and have a look at this self-assessment after you've read the guidance note and just work, work, work your way down these statements and just reflect on where you think you are on 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 this scale that we've uh, put against each of these statements and then and then i guess reflect on the profile of your responses and the reason we introduce this is really as a conversation start, starter so if you you might do this within your team and then compare compare your results or you might do it within your organization or you might use this to trigger a conversation with somebody more senior than you or even with a client so so we'd really encourage you to do this um because we think it's a really useful exercise and, and if nothing else, it will, will get you thinking further about this topic. Gert Jan, would you like to um, add, a, uh, add a few points in terms of other things that people can take away from this? Yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to do. And I think uh, this self-assessment is a great hands-on tool to start and lead the conversation. And um, yeah, if you start thinking about implementing uh, something like business automation, um, yeah, as I'm working for, a, in this case, a software company, I think it's a good to share some things there or that you could consider when buying these types of, uh, of software. Um, and yeah, this maybe uh, enables you to get the most out of your investment in this case. Well, first of all, I think yeah, I mentioned it before, it's important that you, uh, that you can walk before you start running. And of course, it is uh, always tempting to start all kinds of activities to create value from data. But um, as also stressed in the guidance note uh, as well, I think uh, it is important to get the basics in place first. Eh? And if you have the, the basics right, uh, then you can start thinking about embarking uh, on more complex uh, initiatives. And when the foundation is there, you can also take all, the, all these next steps uh, to work you towards a single uh, pane of glass. And second, um, Choose all, uh, this is important to, uh, to mention, or choose wisely when buying uh, a, a business automation in this case, uh, and look for a supplier that can really offer you a truly single source of, uh, of truth solution. Because uh, especially in the field of IWMS solutions, there are some suppliers that can offer you great functionality and also the, functionality, the, the full spectrum of IWMS functionality. But if you look more closely at the, the way they offer it, you might find that in the end, it is mainly based on separate solutions that became part of the supplier's um, solution portfolio due to the mergers and uh, acquisitions that uh, took place. So please investigate uh, whether you are dealing uh, with a true integrated solution in this case. 
And in addition to that, uh, make sure that this integrated solution is a future-proof investment. Uh, we discussed that the built environment is becoming smarter and smarter day by day, driven by those uh, developments around prop tech and smart building technology. Um, and within your real estate portfolio, this will lead to a probably a diverse set of technologies delivered by a variety of suppliers. And therefore, look for a, a solution that enables you to take advantages of the ongoing digitization in the built environment and uh, the diversity of data sources that this will bring. Invest in a solution in this case that can support you to connect and extend in an uh, easy and scalable and manageable way to get the most value out of all these new types of data sources. And in the case of an uh, IWMS, the building owners and building occupiers should look for a solution that is based on an open platform uh, architecture, which is able to, to, uh, to monitor, monitor, but also analyze and orchestrate the insights that are coming from all those multiple property related data sources. And also makes, it, uh, makes all these connections that you will get in place manageable and also scalable. And then you can keep up with uh, the high pace of digitalization, I think, and innovation in the world of real estate and facilities management. Um, so in the end, it's not uh, only uh, that if you choose these types of software solutions that also are capable to, to, to open up and to extend and to easily connect, I think this will not only improve uh, the decision making, uh, but will also increase the added value that it can bring uh, also to the organizational uh, bottom line. And that's not only now you know but also aiming uh, and looking towards uh, the future which is really important when you do these types of investments so i believe uh we came to the to this the last part of this webinar peter isn't it the the q a session indeed and what, what an action-packed webinar it's been so thank you gentlemen for going through that and again such a stellar stellar um, amount of content in this episode and it probably could go on for another hour but I'm aware of our audience and questions have been coming through and we have scheduled this to one o'clock so just for the audience it is being recorded we might slightly go over one but I promise we won't be too much over one just to get as many of your questions in as you possibly can so I've grouped a couple of the questions that have come in um, and no surprise, the dreaded return on investment that tends to come back on, on a lot of these questions around possible solutions. So I guess more aimed at you, Gert Jan, and obviously James, Ian, like to get your viewpoint from your interviews, whether there was some synergy or commonality with uh, people's I, uh, IWMS systems and was there different ways of how people collect data. But essentially, what are the uh, savings and benefits of a strong IWMS system? Uh, so a little bit expanding upon your point around the return on investment so I've grouped a couple of questions there in one yeah I can understand these types of question and uh, I, I presented that example also that example case of uh, for Dantix and I think in that case it was pretty much focused on uh, on quantitative elements yeah, like reducing costs or improving productivities but i think you can also find uh, benefits in the more qualitative areas like uh, yeah in, uh, ensuring compliance for instance yeah, if you have your data available in one single source of truth is really makes reporting on some compliance or rules or regulations types of topics more easily. Uh, I can think about uh, ensuring business uh, continuity. If you have your asset management processes automated with, with IWMS types of uh, solutions, uh, you can really prevent things to break down or to, to stop working, you know? So uh, that, that not only, yeah, uh, is, is something that you can turn into money or in, into real value, but it's, uh, these are more those qualitative types of, uh, of aspects. But in the end, it always depends on what your, the scope of your functionality that you want to use uh, will be. And these things determine uh, also the, yeah, the benefits or the, the value that it will bring. And Ian, I guess, bit? yeah, Thank you, Gert. That's great. Ian, I guess you got your hand up there quickly and put it down. But from that point of view, um, was there anything learned from the research yeah. and obviously the interviews around how people manage their possible solutions around this? Not so much the, the research data on this one, but when Gert Jan was sharing that Vedantic's case study slide and it was showing how quick the return on investment was, it made me reflect on a piece of work that we did um, two or three years ago with a local government in the north of the UK. Um, and 
uh, it was really, really interesting because I, I think there's, there's almost a subtlety here. If you are talking about a first generation implementation, those sorts of figures genuinely are, in, are quite stunning because of what you can achieve. If it's maybe a sort of second or third generation, we've tried this or we're moving to this or we're already partially automated, but now we need to go in that direction. It might be more subtle, but we certainly saw fig figures and return on investment at that speed in that kind of scope. So it, it's interesting because it's almost that 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 true challenge of trusting the evidence, trusting the degree to which the due diligence has been done, trusting the costing, trusting the evidence, because it might be a significant outlay, but the return on investment really can be that powerful. Uh, that's uh, anything to add on that, James? No, I think they were two good responses. I guess the only thing would be around, you know, it's easy to focus on the cost and not the value of, of, of that equation. And, um, you know, this is something we talked about in a previous or an earlier webinar and another guidance note we wrote with IWFM. But, you know, it's the same same issue really around becoming preoccupied with cost and, and not the value and the benefits of, of that investment. No, that's great. And, and questions are flying through, so I'm trying to keep up with these. Um, thank you, Charlotte, for your question. And um, she does put a little caveat around it that she appreciates it's subjective. But um, what would you say are the top three data streams that the majority of your clients are analysing? So is it commonplace what the top three areas, streams are looking at, Gertian, or is that too varied client by client? Indeed, it may it, it varies per client uh, a lot, but in the end, then if you look at what an IWMS uh, is about, I can only talk about an IWMS in this case. We cover a couple of different uh, solution domains. It's about real estate management. It can be about space and workplace management. It is about asset and maintenance management, uh, integrated services management, more the soft side of facility management. I don't know if that is a common term to use in the UK, but it's about catering, cleaning, uh, security, those types of processes, but also sustainability management. And uh, it depends a bit uh, also the domain in which our client is active. If you look at the more governmental organizations, they usually use it for asset and maintenance on their, uh, their, their, their real estate portfolio. So then you talk about data streams around real asset kind of related topics. But uh, for example, universities who have a broad, uh, yeah, use the, the IWMS functionality in a broad way to do their campus management, they also talk about those more soft side related uh, services and then you have different types of data streams and what you nowadays on top of that see sees occurring is the data streams about uh, workplace usage utilization based on sensor readings and that kinds of thing so yeah as you, yeah, you you hear in my answer it, it really varies a lot and it's really a broad perspective of what is um, what is most of the time used but it always starts with that mostly uh, triggered by a portfolio type of data stream as the real estate, assets, that kind of things. James Ian, anything to add on that from your your experience? No, no, I'll get a no on that, but hopefully that's answered to a part of Charlotte, your question. Um, there's a couple of questions come in around, um, I don't know, it sends a shiver down my spine, but it, it's, it's all integrity about data manipulation. And it's something that has been a challenge in the past, not in my current role. But do you have any advice? And I guess this is the cultural aspect that the webinar talked about today. So the questions came in um, about, do you have any advice in managing up to ensure we maintain and drive integrity within teams and senior leaders when it comes to data? So. Um, Ian, anything to add to that from a cultural the, perspective? I think, James, it's in the other guidance note, isn't it? It's in the other data guidance note um, that we wrote for IWFM. Um, there's a model. This is about awareness, I think, because this is one of those things which is different given different organisations and different stakeholders involved. But there's a decision making framework called the integrated decision making framework um, and it, it, it's got four quadrants it says that you know we can think about making decisions based around rational reasons non-rational reasons cultural reasons and political reasons and what it's encouraging you to do is kind of go look if you think that an organization 
just makes evidence-based decisions on rational data that isn't really how the real world works and, and rather than get stroppy about that and rather than push against that you need to understand it and use it accordingly so how do you use the sorts of data the sorts of evidence that can be either generated to justify an IWMS system or through an IWMS system to talk to stakeholders who potentially operate in a different way and you know that takes practice that takes skill that takes a step up for a profession if it wants to be able to you know engage effectively at a strategic level at a leadership level um, it, it kind of says you know you need to embrace this you need to understand it and you need to work with it as opposed to getting uh, annoyed and blindsided by it. Anything to add to that, James, obviously with the experience you had? Um... No, I think Ian sort of answered that perfectly. So, yeah, I won't. I won't uh, Too good to stellar anything. answers. This is the problem, folks. <laughs> Gert, anything from you? I guess what about where some questions are coming about sharing data and ensuring that people do not, I guess it comes under manipulation. How do you ensure that from a process perspective? Yeah, that was what I was thinking about as well. It's always hard to prevent people manipulating data because it is, it's a bit of a, a cultural perspective. Eh? What do you want to achieve? Why would you like to achieve it? And till, uh, up till a certain level, I think business automation can help you prevent it a bit eh? by using uh, authorization uh, configuration settings and uh, uh, the, what could be a practical approach is by uh, when you are start implementing an, uh, an, an, a business automation by thinking about uh, who is able to create certain data who is able to read it who is able to delete it or, or or use it in any way i think it is a familiar word uh, using the crud matrix the curd matrix and um what we usually do when we start implementing this is by discussing with the organization which stakeholders are involved and which data sets are involved and you have got you've got one axis with all the data uh, sources and the other access with all those stakeholders and then you you can determine who is able to create it or who's able to read it or who can do nothing with it you know as it, you can authorize it out of their 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 list in, in some way you know so i think in that way you can prevent that people uh can manipulate data to, to, until a certain level and i think you can also prevent that if you are start sharing data people will ruin your your treasure uh, of data you know that is something that you don't want to happen of course so i think in that way you can organize the process around it peter there's well, just a couple of things i'd add there one is around what are the questions that somebody's trying to answer and that should drive you know what data is collected and how it's analyzed but the the other thing is understanding what maybe sits behind that manipulation and and you know what why are people doing that and that kind of links to what ian said but also links to I, I was listening to a podcast yesterday a bbc podcast analysis and one of the things they were talking about was data and data during the last 12 months from a pandemic point of view and one of the people on the podcast made an interesting point around yeah we use the term bias all the time but actually what what we should be talking about is values what are the values that are driving the way people use or interpret data and, and maybe put the word bias to one side because it's you know these are value driven decisions aren't they what we do with data how we interpret it and um how we analyze it and even how we collect it is all values driven so maybe we need to rather than trying to pretend that's not happening be more open about that and and reflect on that in a little bit more detail and I think it's interesting there, Gert referred to it, and you've just said there about some of the terminology and that interpretation. I looked at the word manipulation and saw it as a negative, but in some ways it's how how you actually, why you're doing that and what's the purpose and value of doing that. Now I'm going to play a bit of role play with you folks that um, from the perspective of a number of questions have come in around this and maybe why we've got an audience, uh, certain members of the viewers um, on the webinar is around uh, probably a situation that he or she, an FM real estate person's on this uh, webinar today and they're facing this problem day in, day out. Now, if you were in the shoes of he or she around what recommendations would you have in preparing a business case for possibly putting some of these data um, solutions in place to, to senior leaders? So I guess from what you've heard today from the research, 
a minute answer each if you can because of time what what would be your takeaway really to get across to the business leaders their return on investment so i don't know who wants to start with that but again i've tried to group a number of questions where i feel there's a number of our audience facing this currently now and it might be keeping them up at night so um it'd be good just to have a bit of viewpoint from your stellar panel how would you tackle this problem if you were in their shoes so who wants to be brave no, and go I'll, first I'll, I'll go first and i'll keep it brief to give everybody else a chance but yeah i mean my my view is what what difference is it going to make to the to the core business i guess to the to the people that you're supporting and can you demonstrate that and and show where it's going to add value there and you know that might not always be a, a clear direct link but you need to try and make that link um and i guess the other thing is being mindful and this is something we talk about in the guidance note is you know ian's mentioned it already not seeing technology as a silver bullet but also acknowledging the cultural barriers head on um, you know that's came through really strongly in the interviews you know you can focus on the technical stuff but that's not you're not it's unlikely you're going to solve that, your problems just focusing on the technical stuff you know be honest about the cultural challenges and and make sure they're factored into the business case so if i pick up the baton from james there and sort of linking to that idea of an integrated decision making framework if you all stood there in front of uh, a leadership team and you're trying to get their buy-in for something that needs implementing in that organization evidence is one part of it so you need evidence you need a compelling demonstration of your strategy what you're going to do with that evidence what you're going to do with that data but the other thing you've got to trigger and this is the bit that we i, I think as a profession we generally tend to forget about is you need an emotional response from that group so what is the problem that they're trying to solve kind of links to what james was talking about because if you can appease their pains or if you can show them gains which they cannot refuse then you're in a far better position to get their buy-in so um it, it's it, it's actually it, it kind of links to something else that we've written a guidance note about called selling your workplace vision in that guidance note we might be talking about more kind of experiential workplace from a customer or a um, employee perspective but it goes for anything if you're stood there in front of a leadership team or anybody that you need to get bought into what you're trying to do you need to get their emotional buy-in and you need to use data to essentially tell a story so that that happens no, yeah thank you i think this is okay. spot on yeah if i may reflect to this uh, as well uh, i think in the world, no CEO is awake at night for not having an IWMS, but they are awake at night for not achieving their, what we loosely call strategic objectives. And I showed you a couple of, uh, of examples, you know, I think those five that were in my slide, uh, increasing productivity, reducing costs, ensure compliance, ensure business continuity, even employee engagement, these types of topics, these are always on some board agendas, you know, and I think if you can hook on your story on those types of topics, yeah, this is uh, that that is a compelling story for them, and I think that with these types of examples and also fact-driven, uh, practical examples, you uh, I think you can convince quite a lot of leadership teams in the end. And that seems a real nice way just to stop proceeding. So um, I want to just uh, apologise to those individuals that have sent questions through. We will pass on to the respective um, speakers to get an answer and we'll get back to you. Um, and there was a couple of phrases that uh, came out on the webinar that um, I think if you were uh, writing up about the golden source was referred to and the single pane of glass. So maybe that's the bit that we need to all aspire to. Um, so. I want to say a massive thank you to Gert Jan, um, James and Ian for your, for your stellar presentation today. There was a lot of information in there, really pulling on the guide itself and also experience Gert Jan from Plan On. So we want to say a massive thank you to that. For the audience, we've just got a couple of closing note slides and then, then we're nearly there. So uh, thank you, James, Ian and Gert Jan once again. Thank you. So, so as promised, um, we referred to a number of guidance as well as the one with plan on and Ian referred to a couple of other workplace guidance we have on our website. So this is where you will find these are where they are housed on our Insight Hub at IWFM. So dedicated contact to hubs, research reports, good practice guides, guidance notes and more. And that's where you will find the guidance note that was referenced throughout today's webinar on our website. So please, please look at that. And it's also been posted in the chat I noticed earlier. Um, 
uh, on the software. So please, please get, in, get, get a read on that and hopefully uh, start utilising it across your business. So just in terms of next slide, sorry. Um, yeah, COVID-19 resources. This is a page that we started last year, sadly a year on as everyone uh, remembered yesterday. It's a, um, a resource that we um, update regularly, as I've already said. So please look at that. That's obviously changing as, as policy changes and government legislation. So please, please have a look at that for that free resource. And just moving on. This is the last slide. So I just want to say a massive thank you again for the speakers as well as Planon, who's been our partner on that guidance note and obviously the research that Ian and James and Gert Yam went through today. But lastly, I just want to say a massive thank you to the audience viewers that join our Navigating Turbulent Times series. We do act, we do listen, we, we do have a survey that will be sent to you after this um, webinar closes to get your feedback, not just only on this webinar, but what else would you want to know about data and future episodes so not necessarily linked to technology but what other sub subjects would uh, you like to see so that really drives our program for these NTTs because we listen to our audience so we're hoping to give back what you want we do have episode 42 can't believe I'm saying that because I was on episode one um, next week that will be advertised on Friday and that is our third in our series with Make UK and that's around employment law and legislation so please look out for the details of that that should be out Friday but once again um, a massive thank you for you joining today's webinar and as always uh, keep safe and hope to see you soon on our next episode so thanks again take care everyone